uh, gives me enormous uh, pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Robert Fontana. Uh, I'll start by noting uh, that he is a Michiganian, uh, grew <laughs> up in Gross Point. Uh, he did his undergraduate at Wayne State, where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa, uh, on to medical school at the University of Michigan. Uh, he did residency in internal medicine at Northwestern. Uh, he was chief resident. Uh, and then he returned to the University of Michigan for his gastroenterology fellowship, and he has remained there. Uh, right now, he is the medical director of the liver transplant program, as well as the transplant hepatology fellowship. Uh, but mainly uh, what he has done at Michigan is he has uh, climbed the ranks to full professor of medicine, and he's done so by establishing a stellar academic record. He is a member of three active and NIH-funded national consortiums. They are in acute liver failure, uh, drug-induced liver injury, and hepatitis B. He has served on multiple committees in both liver disease and transplant. He served on editorial boards on the most prestigious journals in our fields. Uh, and he has over 200 publications in peer-reviewed journals. And, uh, Last thing, but not leastly, he is a good friend to many of us in the hepatology group. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, I'll introduce uh, Robert Fontana, who's going to be speaking on updates in acute liver failure. Well, thanks, uh, Dell, for the very warm introduction. It's nice to be back here with friends and colleagues uh, from over the years. Um, it's always strange when you become the senior guy. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, it's great to be here. Um, so as Dilip mentioned, I've been sort of um, doing a variety of things for the past 20 years. And one of them that's been probably the most gratifying is participating in a, a network of other centers um, studying acute liver failure, which as you may know, is a pretty rare disease. So for those of you who aren't hepatologists, this may seem a little bit esoteric. Um, but it's actually an important uh, reason that we consider patients for liver transplant. And there's some new and exciting sorts of things that we're doing that I think uh, uh, hopefully will be of, of interest to you and help move the, the field forward. So um, what I'll go over with you is to just first give you the big picture of like what causes this entity and what this entity is defined as. And then we'll talk about acetaminophen overdose, which continues to be a big problem, about 60,000 overdoses a year in the US, and I'm sure you see plenty here, unfortunately. And then we'll talk about the role of NAC, N-acetylcysteine, and non-acetaminophen acute liver failure, and some recent um, epidemiologic trends we've seen and how use of that may be improving outcomes. Um, and then we'll talk about the sort of the ICU level of this disease, because that's where these patients really belong, is in the intensive care unit and the complexity of trying to manage them, particularly as you list them for liver transplant, and then how they do with transplantation. So first off, um, you know, there's lots of liver disease in the outpatient world of chronic hepatitis C and fatty liver and so on and so forth. But this entity that we're talking about is almost inevitably hospitalized patients who are acutely ill. And when we say acute liver failure or fulminant hepatitis, we're specifically defining individuals who develop a coagulopathy, that is their INR goes up to greater than 1.5 with mental status changes relatively recently, within 26 weeks, usually it's within eight weeks. It's not the common reason that you see patients with liver disease in the hospital. So, I bet you right now there's a few patients um, on the inpatient ward who have alcoholic hepatitis with a high INR and abnormal mental status. That's not acute liver failure. Hepatitis B that's chronic and intermittently flares is not acute liver failure. And then in the surgical intensive care unit where you have sick individuals on TPN and infections and so on and so forth, um, it's not cholestasis with DIC. So that's what it's not. Um, and it's, it's important because everything I talk about subsequently is de dependent upon the definition of the patients that we're uh, referring to. Now the reason that we sort of pull this out of all of hepatology as an important topic is that these individuals can develop rapidly progressive cerebral edema, brain swelling, which can be fatal in uh, otherwise healthy individuals. Um, 
And again, to know that these individuals can do very poorly and knowing that you need to consider transplantation, some of them early on, is really, really important. Then we'll talk about how uh, they do post-transplant, which is quite remarkable since it's always emergency surgery from the ICU, oftentimes intubated patients with about a 75 to 80% one-year survival. So how uncommon is uh, uncommon? It's, it's rare. It's about two to 3,000 individuals a year in the entire U.S. So if you think of Michigan as being 140th or 150th of the whole U.S. population, that's about 50 to 60 cases in the entire state a year. So it's, it's not a common clinical entity. So because it's not common, our evidence base of what to do is limited, right? It's hard to do studies in a very rare disease. Um, so we do know a couple things, though, that definitely should be sort of the standard of care. Uh, N-acetylcysteine for acetaminophen overdose, and not just patients who get to acute liver failure, anyone who shows up in the ER with acetaminophen overdose. I will show you some of the data on non-acetaminophen-based acute liver failure. H2 blockers, when we used to use them in the 80s and 90s, reduced um, uh, ICU um, GI bleeding. CVVHD was better tolerated than hemodialysis in a study of 30 patients. And mannitol versus no mannitol lowered intracranial pressure. So if you're a purist, this is all you would do would be on the left-hand side of the slide. But there's certain things that you shouldn't do based upon what we've learned. So don't give steroids out of desperation. It's been tried twice in two prospective studies and not shown to improve um, outcomes. Enteral decontamination with old antibiotics from the 80s and 90s didn't do anything. No one's done a study with rifaximin in acute liver failure. Charcoal hemoperfusion, where you take the blood out of the body, you circulate it through a charcoal filter, trying to remove hepatotoxins. That didn't work. In fact, it caused a lot of thrombocytopenia and bleeding. And then more recently, about 10 years ago, a bioartificial liver using porcine hepatocytes and a dialysis cartridge didn't work. And then albumin dialysis, which I was really hopeful would work because it's such a simple concept of hooking it up to a hemodialysis unit that also didn't work in a multi-center uh, study from France. So those don't help your patients. So when you're trying to manage an individual patient, the first thing is to figure out what's causing the acute liver failure. And um, you'll, as you'll see in the next slide, acetaminophen is the most common reason that patients develop this clinical entity. So you want to look for that based upon history as well as a blood level um, and also using a drug screen because it's often taken with other uh, substances. Viral hepatitis, you know, you can order an acute hep A, B, and C serologies and PCRs. But these other uh, diagnoses require a little bit more sophistication and time to sort out. So once in a while, autoimmune hepatitis will present with fulminant phenotype. So those patients, you need to get autoantibodies and invariably a biopsy to be certain about what you're treating. Uh, women in the third trimester of pregnancy, there's this whole differential diagnosis of liver dysfunction, uh, fatty liver of pregnancy, preeclampsia, et cetera. Um, those individuals can um, present with liver failure either prepartum or postpartum, which is also an important point to realize. Even after delivery, the liver failure can set on. Uh, herpes and CMV are less than 1%, so they're rare. We always look for them, but they're treatable. Malignancy, I'd say about once a year, we'll see someone present with really fulminant cancer, oftentimes a breast cancer or lung cancer that just completely infiltrates the liver. And obviously that's important to know because we're not likely going to want to do a transplant there. Um, I'm from Michigan, so everyone at least has to consider Wilson's disease and the differential diagnosis, which is extremely rare. It's about one in a million. Uh, but um, it's important to establish for uh, uh, family screening. Bud Chiari, also very rare. And then in Michigan, we don't see this. If we were in Texas, we would of heat stroke. After marathons and things, uh, people can get into trouble as well. So again, perspective is key for um, uh, complex diseases. And so as this uh, slide shows, um, this is from the acute liver failure study group that we've been participating in for um, 15 years. This was a recent cut of the data of 2,000 adults. You can see on the far left-hand side of the slide, acetaminophen overdose, the size of the bar on the, the left y-axis is indicative of the number of patients, is by far and away the most common. So if nothing else, you'll remember that. Um, 
Then the other bars that have some height to them are drug-induced liver injury, that's idiosyncratic, dilly, um, indeterminate acute liver failure, and then the rest are all kind of small players. But the reason that's important to know about the differential diagnosis is the spontaneous survival rate, that is the likelihood of leaving the hospital without a liver transplant alive, is related to the etiology, which is the, the black dots. So patients with acetaminophen overdose, hepatitis A and ischemia actually do pretty well with supportive uh, hospital management, whereas basically the other groups don't do well in the absence of urgent liver transplant. Now, in addition to the etiology, the severity of the maximal degree of encephalopathy on a scale of one to four, four being completely comatose, is also a simple bedside marker. So etiology and encephalopathy grade will help prognosticate in an individual patient. So you can see here across the bar that if you're a coma grade three, four, you're not gonna do as well as if you peaked out at a, a coma grade one, two, um, independent of the etiology. So in addition to the um, diagnosis, we wanna know if there's disease-specific therapy that you can offer. So with acetaminophen overdose, as you know, if you catch someone within a few hours of ingestion, you can lavage the stomach and give activated charcoal, that's usually already done in the ER, and then rapidly start N-acetylcysteine. Um, Amanita, mushroom toxicity, I think I've seen two cases ever in the state of Michigan. Um, we just don't see it in California and other areas of the country, they see it more. You can lavage out the um, amotoxins and also dialyze them out. Autoimmune hepatitis is theoretically treatable with steroids. Um, Bud Chiari, if you can anticoagulate your patient, uh, hepatitis B, and so on. Wilson's disease should theoretically be treatable with a chelation where you basically bind the free copper and the uh, circulating serum. We've tried that many times, as have others, and not been able to rescue someone from a liver transplant, but we still try. So acetaminophen is really an important cause. Um, the data actually from this study has partly led to some of the labeling changes you heard about about two years ago. Um, the FDA has been carefully monitoring this and despite changes in the labeling of acetaminophen-based analgesics about two years ago, we're continuing to see even in 2015 and 2016, about 50% of patients with acute liver failure, adults that is, um, is due to acetaminophen overdose. So it's a big public health problem because it's completely avoidable, right? if you didn't take too much. So it's the most common thing, and how do you make a diagnosis? Well, it initially starts as a clinical diagnosis with a high index of suspicion. How much is too much? Um, I saw a patient this morning who um, was taking four grams of Tylenol a day, and he called his nurse, and the nurse said, absolutely don't do that, you're gonna go into liver failure, which is not true. <laughs> It is a dose-dependent hepatotoxin, but you have to take very high doses of acetaminophen, usually greater than six grams at a single time point. But if you overdose over several days, you can still also get into trouble. Um, fasting depletes your glutathione, alcohol revs up your oxidative metabolism, so those are risk factors. And clinically, most patients present with a high AST and ALT and a normal or near normal bilirubin. That's an important point um, from the get-go. And you can check a serum acetaminophen level, but bear in mind, again, if the bilirubin level is elevated and you're using a color metric assay, you can get a false positive acetaminophen level. Um, so let me go back here. So you're probably familiar with this from uh, those of you who've done internal medicine um, and ER training of the RUMAC nomogram. This was developed back in the 1980s um, by a toxicologist, and basically, this is the plasma acetaminophen level here on the y-axis and the time after a single time point ingestion. And if your patient's blood level falls up high, they're very high risk for developing toxicity and it's recommended they get NAC. And here, these patients didn't get into hepatotoxicity. So it's a useful stratifying tool, although it's not an absolute rule. And in the original study, going back to 1981, all these patients actually got NAC and less than 1% died, and it was the patients who had an ALT greater than 1,000 or if a delay in NAC was associated with fatalities. So the point of this is if you suspect acetaminophen overdose, you should immediately just give NAC and don't, don't wait. 
So what is NAC? It's N-acetylcysteine. It's a sulfa-containing drug. It smells. It can cause nausea and vomiting. But it works. Um, you give it orally as a loading, and then every uh, four hours for up to 72 hours. And if you have someone with refractory nausea and vomiting or who can't take something by mouth, you can give IV NAC, but you've just increased the cost by 10 to 20-fold. So think about that before just reflexively going to IV NAC. Um, and uh, specifically, though, where it is recommended to go to IV is if you happen to have someone with a short gut, um, an ileus where the drug's not going to be absorbed, or in a, in a pregnant woman. There, the dosing is slightly different. But remember, you're giving now an IV sulfa drug, so what can happen? You can get a hypersensitivity reaction, right? So if your patient has sulfa allergy, don't give them an IV um, sulfa drug. Um, and there's some weak data suggesting it may be proarrhythmic, although that really hasn't panned out in prospective studies. So we looked at our data from the um, ALF study base about 10 years ago. We actually have another paper coming out in the next year, but it pretty much mirrors what we found 10 years ago. Um, and that is that roughly of the patients with acute liver failure, that is the worst of the worst with acetaminophen overdose, there's about 60,000 cases a year of overdose, but only about 500 of them will get to acute liver failure criteria. Amongst the acute liver failure, roughly half of them are intentional overdose, that is someone knowingly took too much as a suicide gesture. But well, quite concerning is that nearly half of them are non-intentional. So in other words, these are people going to the doctor for some medical reason, and they get too much, oftentimes through active prescription or lack of knowledge or a combination of those two factors. So in the non-intentional patients, they presented with lower ALT. They still took a whopping dose of acetaminophen. They had lower blood levels of presentation, but they were oftentimes polypharmacy here. 40% um, of patients were taking one, more than one acetaminophen-based analgesic. The majority were taking a narcotic-based analgesic. And it's actually this data that led to the uh, reformulation of Vicodin, which, as you know, was the most commonly used narcotic in the U.S. for years. They got rid of the uh, Vicodin ES that had 750 milligrams. It's no longer available. And they reformulated most of the acetaminophen-containing analgesics to reduce the amount. Because these patients were oftentimes getting narcotics, they oftentimes had more encephalopathy at presentation, but their outcomes were actually as good as the uh, intentional ones that were caught quickly in terms of the rate of listings for transplant and actual transplant and overall survival. And again, when we've updated the analysis recently, we're finding essentially the same trends that the non-intentional patients can do as well as the intentional overdose patients, even though they're presenting later in the injury course. So clinically, what do you do when you have one of these patients? Well, you, you need to monitor them in a proper and safe environment, which is, should be your intensive care unit. And it's like other sort of critical illnesses in the ICU. It's a trend over time that you're really looking for. Is the INR getting worse? Is it getting better? Is the factor five going down or is it coming back up? You're looking for really trends over time, uh, lactate levels, serial ammonia levels, and so on. And one of the key things you don't want to miss is hypoglycemia because your liver is obviously the source of glucose stores and gluconeogenesis. And when your liver's acutely failing, it's not going to be able to maintain a blood sugar level, so you need to supplement. Um, and oftentimes the question comes up from the intensivist, well, you know, this guy's intubated, he doesn't look good, should we do a biopsy to see if he's going to regenerate or not? And that's never been shown to be helpful clinically with prognostication, and it's also very tricky to do a transjugular biopsy in these patients. So we don't recommend that unless it's going to help you with your diagnosis, not for prognosis. Now, in the ICU, um, these patients are critically ill. They oftentimes have multiple lines in. They get infections very commonly because your liver is actually the largest mass of Kupfer cells in your entire body. And it's not just the hepatocytes that aren't doing well. It's your immune system is also um, uh, malfunctioning. So they get a lot of bacterial infections, often the types of things that we see in an ICU, staph, strep, and gram-negative rods, respiratory and urinary pathogens. And then if someone sort of is not doing well three to five days in their hospital stay, think about fungal infections superimposed on their clinical syndrome. If they start getting a fever, more hypotensive, that's what fungus can look like. So most of us use preemptive broad-spectrum antibiotics. We try to avoid nephrotoxic drugs. 
and try to keep the fever and temperature down because that can worsen cerebral edema and the hyperdynamic state. Coagulopathy is really the, one of the biggest clinical challenges here. They get low platelet count, high INR, and a component of poor clearance of the products of coagulation. So their um, uh, a DIC profile is usually chronically positive in, a, in an acute liver failure setting. So interestingly, only about 10% of patients bleed though, because it may be that you're imbalancing your procoagulants with your anticoagulants, and some may actually be hypercoagulable, which is a little bit counterintuitive when you just look at the INR alone. Um, so the places where the patients tend to bleed are the mucosal surfaces in the GI tract. We use PPIs, although they've never been prospectively proven. They've certainly taken over H2 blockers. And then the question always comes up, well, should I give FFP? This guy may bleed. What if he's going to develop an intracranial bleed? You don't want to do that, and you'll see actually it can actually harm your patient by just prophylactically transfusing, transfusing without a procedure plan. If you do have a procedure planned, you're going to want to try to address your coag status as best you can. So in addition to general supportive care, is there anything more that we've learned that we can do that will help our patients? So this was a um, multi-center randomized controlled trial done by the study group published in 2009 where we took patients who did not have acetaminophen-based acute liver failure but had drug-induced liver injury, autoimmune hepatitis, hep B, or indeterminate acute liver failure, and they were randomized to IV NAC for 72 hours versus placebo. And very simple study design, but very difficult to actually implement. And of course, we hypothesized that the NAC-treated patients would do better. Now, the primary outcome when the study was designed was overall survival at three weeks, and you can see there was no significant difference in the orange bars versus the blue bars. However, transplant-free survival was significantly better. And certainly all of us who practice transplant would say it's better to leave the hospital with your own liver intact than with someone else's uh, put into you. Now, it was the, the patients with early stage encephalopathy who got the most benefit out of NAC. If you were advanced encephalopathy, it really didn't help, and in fact, it may have actually had a tendency towards worsening. So this tells us that we want to be aggressive, particularly in the early stage encephalopathy patients. Now, as I mentioned to you, we're starting to see sort of when you have a rare disease, you have a study that's published, does that change the standard of care? Well, none of the practice guidelines actually, you know, recommend that you necessarily give NAC to non-acetaminophen acute liver failure, and in fact, it did not get approval by the FDA because the FDA always wants two studies before they're going to approve uh, something, even in a rare disease, and this was the only study. So what's happened is there's been a drift in clinical practice, and so what I mean by that is this is um, um, a paper we just published in Annals of Internal Medicine about a month ago, and what this shows is this is the um, overall use of NAC in patients with acute liver failure. This is acetaminophen patients, and the blue bar is the non-acetaminophen. And we actually published the study here in 2009, although the results were known in about 2007. So once people heard about this, they started to use NAC in, in their centers. And these are the centers participating in the, in the study group. So you can see the proportion of patients really has gone up quite a bit in the non-acetaminophen group. So you say, well, that's interesting. But we also noticed a couple other things happened, again, in clinical practice. The use of pressors was reduced, intubation, and use of transfusions all were statistically significantly lower over time while NAC use is increasing. So we have multiple things going on at the same time, but what counts is the bottom line. So the bottom line here is overall patient survival here in the red is actually improving. So that's actually a good thing. So these adjustments that we're making, whether it's the use of NAC or less use of intubation, pressors, um, may make a difference. And you may say, well, that may be just because certain sites came and went and their practices changed. And we were one of the six sites that have been in the study group for the whole time. And you can see here that in the, the survival in our center also improved over time as it did in others. And then this is a really important statistic here in the green, which is transplant-free survival. 
So patients who got listed for a transplant, that they were more likely to survive here in 2013 than they were here in, uh, back in 1998. And it went almost double from 20 to 40 percent. So this is very important for those, again, who practice um, transplant hepatology. So what do you do for liver transplant evaluation? This can be done very quickly. Um, you got to know what the patient has and what the likelihood is that they're going to survive, right? Um, your surgeons are going to need to sort of say, is this a technically doable um, uh, patient from a cardiopulmonary perspective and um, morphology, et cetera? You have to make sure that there aren't other diseases that you don't know about, make sure they're not actively infected, uh, and you can do all this in about 12 hours. So you can decide whether to list someone or not uh, pretty much the same day once you get this information. So while you're deciding, you need to manage the patient in front of you, and one of the key and tricky parts of this disease is cerebral edema, which is brain swelling, and it can uh, be very subtle in its onset, just sort of slight slurring of words or hyperreflexia, and before you know it, your patient's comatose. So again, they need to be, whoops, they need to be um, carefully monitored in an ICU setting. So why does cerebral edema happen here? but not in the, you know, literally thousands of cirrhotics to make it into an ICU with chronic liver disease. The reason is, is that the pathophysiology is different. With acute liver failure, you basically have poor clearance of hepatotoxins, right, because the liver is not functioning to clear substances which it normally metabolizes and excretes. So there's more circulating um, substances from a, a failing liver. Um, and in particular, we believe that ammonia and ammonia-like substances, which have been shown to be independent predictors, their levels with the likelihood of developing cerebral edema, causes cellular changes at the microscopic level in the brain. So we believe that these toxins basically make the blood-brain barrier more leaky. And when it's leaky, fluid goes from the... Um, um, intravascular space into the um, tissue space. And as you know, your cranium is a fixed, hard structure. So as this tissue tries to swell, what happens? You basically try to push the cerebral spinal fluid down into the spinal canal. And actually at UCSF, they've actually used um, lumbar puncture as a way to assess cerebral edema, although that's a little tricky to do. But eventually, if this continues to swell, your brain will herniate and you will die. So this is a very key part of the pathophysiology. Um, probably in the later stages, you lose the ability to control your intracranial uh, vascular resistance, which we're all doing. Just when I stood up and walk around and so on, our brains are automatically doing this. But when they're acutely injured, they don't do that. So even just simple movement of the patient's head of the bed can make a big difference if it, with their intracranial pressure. So what does this look like clinically back at the bedside? Well, again, your patient may have s subtle, slow changes. These are people who are not chronically ill. They're coming into the hospital for the first time, so you may not even have sort of a baseline of what there is, although their family may notice that their personality seems different. They're more angry. They're more emotional. They're more labile and so on. So those are useful um, cues. You want them to be in a uh, quiet environment, minimal stimulation. Um, they may have difficulty sleeping. The last thing you want to do is give them a benzodiazepine or trazodone or what have you because that will actually be poorly metabolized and then hang out in the body and actually confuse the clinical picture. And again, in particular, if they have a poor likelihood of surviving, you want to move quickly towards whether or not they're a candidate for a transplant. Grade 2, uh, patients become now disoriented. It's more obvious. Um, drowsy, they may have asterixis, et cetera. And then here now the question is, is this just a disease with diffuse cerebral edema? Do they have a focal neurological deficits and so on? And oftentimes you're going to need to do a head CT in preparation for possible intracranial pressure monitoring. And you may have to um, intubate your patient. And what we like to use is propofol or midazolam to control things with minimal cardiovascular um, impact. And again, antibiotics, prognosis, and so on. Now, um, invariably, as your patient gets intubated, you then have sedative drugs on board, and you've just lost your neuro exam to help guide you. So where are you going with your patient? 
Um, this can be very complicated, and it's not just the brain, it's not just the ventilator, it's not just the dialysis, it's all these things combined at one time in an ICU setting. And, you know, um, changes on the vent can make the intracranial pressure worse or better. The rate at which you dialyze can make the intracranial pressure better or worse. So you need to, you know, start juggling multiple organ systems at the same time. So oftentimes in our ICU, although swans have generally gone out of favor in medical ICUs, they are sometimes helpful, particularly in these patients, because they can develop ARDS, and you don't know what to do with their volume versus pressors, and they're also 50% will develop renal failure. I mentioned to you there was one study that CVVH is preferred over hemodialysis for these patients, because it's better tolerated from a hemodynamic perspective. And at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do, although the liver is failing, you're trying to preserve the brain. So you want to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure at at least 60 millimeters of mercury, which is, you know, we always know what the systemic mean arterial blood pressure is, but we oftentimes don't know what the ICP is short of a direct monitor. So you can potentially give pressors if you know that this is going up to maintain an adequate CPP, but you got to know that number. So there's a couple simple things to avoid this number from going up, avoid straining, valsalvas, and suctioning, keep the head of the bed at least 20 to 30 uh, degrees, and don't use high PEEP ventilation because PEEP in and of itself will increase intracranial pressure. So if you can get the direct number, you can solve the equation much more accurately, um, and so put a monitor in. But remember, now they have the coagulopathy going on at the same time, so it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and neurosurgeons may say, well, show me the data that if, if, you, if I put a monitor in, that you can then do things and your patients will survive better or longer. And what about the risk of intracranial bleeding from putting a bolt directly um, into the intracranial space? So we don't have great um, data to show necessarily that monitoring is better versus no monitoring. There's a huge literature actually in the traumatic brain injury world about the value of monitoring and hypernatremia and so on. But getting back to liver failure patients, we did have this paper that we wrote about 10 years ago. It's purely observational. It's not randomized in any way. And in amongst the centers in the study group, majority did not use ICP monitoring, but about 92 of the patients did get ICP monitoring. You can see we tended to monitor younger patients. They had pretty bad coagulopathy when the monitor was placed in. 100% were intubated, 60% were already on dialysis, and the majority were listed for transplant. So we're being a little bit more aggressive with placing the monitors in listed patients. And what did that allow us to do? It allowed us to manipulate that equation more of the, of the CPP equals MAP minus ICP. So once you know the ICP, you can decide whether or not, for example, you should give pressors. And we gave more pressors to the patients who had a monitor in versus those who didn't have a monitor. And it's not to say you didn't use pressors in the unmonitored patients. We also gave more mannitol for spikes in the ICP because we knew what was going on, uh, whereas the rate of mannitol use was pretty low in the unmonitored patients. And then barbiturates are really only used when you're failing mannitol. So barbiturates were also more commonly used in monitored patients. It makes sense, right? If you know the, the data better, you can have more ICU manipulations. Um, other things that you can do are setting the vent uh, to try to cause some intracranial uh, vasoconstriction of the arteries. The mannitol I mentioned to you is used. You have to be careful here. We're going more and more towards hypertonic saline. It's simpler to control in an ICU setting and there's less volume uh, issues with it. And then the penobarb, you have to be very careful because it can cause hypotension. Now, this is still experimental and I think will always be experimental, which is the use of therapeutic hypothermia for this condition. As you know, that's become the standard of care for out of hospital cardiac arrests and a few other scenarios. But there is some data from King's College where they used cooling blankets in their one study, and they were able to support 13 out of 14 patients with acute liver failure and cerebral edema through a transplant. So that's actually quite good, but it's uncontrolled data. Uh, we recently looked at our data in the ALF uh, study group. This was just published last year. Um, again, this is 
not controlled prospective data, it's purely observational. 97 of the patients in the US centers were cooled versus 1,125 were not cooled. And it was really just to see what happened. And there's similar rates of infections, bleeding, and survival. So our data doesn't in any way suggest that that therapeutic hypothermia was helpful. And in fact, it was usually used as a last ditch effort in someone with refractory intracranial pressure. So that's the data base that we have as of 2015. The other issues that you get into is once you cool, where do you go? Uh, when do you rewarm? What's the proper rate to rewarm? What do you, what do you follow? Um, what about liver regeneration? There's some data in experimental animals that hypothermia may reduce the rate of liver regeneration, so that may not be helping your patient in the long run. So we really need a randomized controlled trial, but this basically fell through the cracks at the NIH because when we submitted the study design to the GI liver section, they said, well, this is more of an ICU type of study. And when we went to the ICU group, they said this is more of a liver study. So here we are, it's 2016, and we still don't know what to do. So I think we're gonna be stuck in this conundrum for a while, uh, but it's just something to consider. There, there is some data. So we do have clinical bedside things to help us. The King's College criteria, I'm not gonna go into great detail. These were published over 30 years ago now. And they're useful, they're simple bedside things like lactate levels and INRs and so on. But what's really new is an index that we're publishing right now called the Acute Liver Failure Study Group because the King's College data was all from the 70s and 80s in England where the access to transplant is very different than it is in the United States. So this is data derived from the Acute Liver Failure Study Group over a 15 year period. And we came up with this equation that involves patients who have more advanced encephalopathy, the etiology, pressors, bilirubin, and INR. And here's the receiver operating curve here in the blue. And higher towards the left corner is better. And so when you then do the air rock calculation, again, the number closer to one is a better model for predicting uh, survival. And you can see that our index was better than the MELD score, which includes bilirubin, INR, and creatinine. Um, and it was better than the King's College criteria. So we think we have a better predictor for US patients than falling back to the historic um, MELD score and King's College scores. So you may say, that's great, how do I use it? Um, so we realized it's one thing to publish a paper with a complicated mathematical equation just like MELD score. So where we're going with this is to actually create an app. Um, and we're in the process of getting this uh, up and running. This is probably what it's gonna look like and you basically just have to enter five variables into the app. You just tap on it. Uh, what's their encephalopathy grade? What's the cause? Are they on pressors, yes or no? What's their bilirubin and what's their INR? And the computer then does the uh, calculation. And amongst the etiologies, you're just gonna pick whether it's favorable or unfavorable. So you, again, you, you need to know obviously what the cause of the acute liver failure is. And you plug it in and you get your number. Uh, and then you have to decide, do you believe that number to help you make decisions at the bedside? So it's not been validated prospectively. We're actually working with some groups in Europe to help, help us validate it and see if we have the right coefficients in the equation. So getting back though to the uh, ICU with the patient in front of you, um, if they're getting sicker, um, and, but their blood pressure's dropping, should you be necessarily going forward with the transplant, organs just become available, maybe tomorrow, et cetera. It's very difficult clinical circumstances to manage. And in fact, about 10 to 20% of patients will die in the ICU listed for liver transplant because their cerebral edema or another uh, complication progresses despite everyone's best efforts. So we, unfortunately, as everyone else, has had to go to making sure the brain is functioning in occasional patients and finding out that they've lost all intracranial blood flow. You don't wanna do a liver transplant there and then that actual individual can become a potential organ donor. So who don't you transplant if the sepsis is uncontrolled, multi-organ failure, refractory hypotension, I'm talking like two, three pressors, 100% oxygen, uncontrolled intracranial hypertension or if they've just had a massive intracranial bleed, which doesn't happen that often, but once in a while does. So there are certain things that we're constantly looking for uh, to not proceed with the transplant. So rather than waiting till the dire end, the key thing is early referral. 
of these patients to a transplant center. The transplant world sort of prioritizes these patients over all cirrhotics. Um, they get the highest theoretical meld or meld sodium score these days. They go right to the top of the list. You can transplant ABO compatible as opposed to identical livers. Uh, uh, s some authors have even talked about ABO incompatible livers out of desperation. Um, the mean time to transplant uh, is, is about three days. So that's quite a long time with a critically ill patient. In the US though, this is pretty uncommon. Again, you know, there's 40 to 50 cases in the whole state. I think between the three transplant programs in Michigan, there might be eight or nine of these cases a year who end up with a liver transplant. So it's not very common. The good news is, is that they generally do quite well despite the emergent nature of the surgery and so on and so forth. So to summarize, I hope I've been able to communicate with you that acute liver failure is a rare but important dramatic illness, usually arising in previously healthy individuals. So making a diagnosis quickly is really important so that you can initiate disease specific therapy as well as general supportive care that we know works. And I would advocate that we should give N-acetylcysteine to anyone who you suspect has any component of acetaminophen in the picture. Um, and certainly, for non-acetaminophen acute liver failure, I've shown you that that trend over time, that survival is improving. Why it's improving, we don't know, but NAC use may be one of them, and that's important to be aware of. But we're still going to have the issues of cerebral edema and sepsis to deal with, so that's, again, on an individualized basis. We like to put ICP monitors in. Um, and where we're going as a study group is really with two new initiatives. One is to say, is the INR really that predictive of bleeding or not? So we're going to be doing a study using the Rotem device in individuals who have this kind of liver problem to see if that's a better predictor. That's basically whole blood clotting that you get in a QVET-based um, test system to see if that's better predictor of bleeding versus clotting uh, prospectively. And then the other thing that I'm most interested in doing and taking a lead on is something called the methacetin breath test, which is actually being used in all forms of chronic liver disease. But it, there's some data to suggest that it may predict who's going to recover. So we're just getting started on that study as well. Probably take about two years to get the data. So, so we're working towards better agnostic tools as well as what to do on an individual case basis. But at the end of the day, invariably, some patients are going to need a liver transplant. And the sooner they get it, probably the better for them in terms of um, the long run. So with that in mind, um, obviously, this is a huge amount of work that I presented. And this is the, the work of many individuals over many years. Um, each year, we get together in Washington. This is Dr. Will Lee, who some of you may know. He's the founder of the study group. Um, and this was a more recent event. And we typically get about 50 to 60 people get together twice a year to kind of brainstorm and come up with new ideas for ancillary studies. We have a website. Um, and then these are the individual sites, and we've recently changed the structure so that the four of us are now kind of all co-running uh, the network um, in the next wave as we go forward. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and see if there's any questions. Thank you. Yeah. That, was, that was excellent. Um, a really great overview, I think, of one of the major issues that we face uh, in liver transplantation. And we see a lot of these patients here and many of the people in the audience uh, because of our involvement in transplant, the ICU, uh, renal failure, they all get involved in these patients as well. But uh, are there questions in the audience? Right. Yeah, so, so we've looked at alcohol as a, um, a predictor of um, likelihood of survival or not. And we've also looked at the patients who got transplanted, which is oftentimes the thing that you're grappling with, right? Should you transplant this patient or not? And what's going to happen? So on the flip side of that, which is the long-term outcome, we've published a couple papers there. And not surprisingly, because you've not had a relationship with that individual patient, you have to decide, like, today or tomorrow, you're going to transplant them. There's a lot of psychiatric comorbidity that goes on post-transplant. And so those patients require 
more follow-up than anyone, even if they've surgically recovered and their LFTs are doing well, because they can fall back into bad habits. And we've had a lot of circumstances where that's an issue. So, um, so the, clearly they're a high risk group, um, but they're generally very young individuals um, who otherwise come from a supportive environment. And so that's, you know, there's no rules of thumb here on how to proceed as you know, this is a very difficult area. Yeah, so if, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but from what I understand, the Camino catheter, which was a popular one, for some reason the manufacturer stopped making it. Um, so our, our neurosurgeons now do the intraparenchymal monitors like they use for traumatic brain injury patients. And um, in that one paper from Dean Carvelis, we actually reported on our updated results of intracranial bleeding, and it's still less than 5% with intraparenchymal monitors. So that's what we use. Interestingly, the um, neurosurgeons now feel comfortable doing this at the bedside, um, which of course makes it a lot easier. You don't have to move the patient down to the OR and all that movement and so on, but that's obviously up to your uh, neurosurgical team. And also I make comment, I don't know who's in the audience, but there's more and more neurointensivists who are neurologists who, from my understanding, are, are doing more of this type of monitoring as well. Um, the other thing that we've looked at is a non-invasive way to get, to get rid of the invasive is the interesting um, idea of the um, optic nerve sheath diameter. So you can use an ultrasound probe on the globe of the eyeball to see what the diameter of the <laughs> optic nerve is. Um, and that's been associated with direct ICP uh, measurements. And that's actually being used again in the neuro critical care trauma world. Um, certainly would be nice to have something that simple at the bedside, but of course, then there's the operator issue of knowing how to interpret the image and are you sure and so on and so forth, but that's an interesting concept. Blood biomarkers are also being investigated, like markers of brain injury, you know, uh, of astrocytes being necrosed and releasing into the systemic circulation. We've looked at a couple of them, and none of them have actually correlated with outcomes, so we don't know really what they mean. So we're, we're looking for non-invasive, um, you know, measurements. So to make it back to your, um, to the app that you're using, so I'm interested to know, you know, early on, some of the data with intracranial pressure monitoring was some of the benefit that we saw in survival was more related, we think, to removing patients who were not going to recover neurologically and not transplanting them. So right. the overall transplant benefits seem to be improved because right. you made more appropriate preventative for them. When you've looked at the app that you've developed, right. um, do you get a sense that you're going to be able to identify a point at which transplant's probably not going to benefit the patient? Yeah, so it goes, that's a good question. So you can build a model to do whatever you want, right? So to, to predict who not to transplant, for example, amongst listed patients. But we didn't do it that way. We looked at the whole universe of acute liver failure patients, partly because we have greater statistical power. And secondly, um, not everyone is a transplant candidate for a variety of reasons. So, um, so we haven't done that exact exercise to see if there's a different set of parameters, for example, once you have someone listed. That being said, we just published a paper in liver transplantation with Rod Reddy, I think is the first author, where he did look at the likelihood of getting a transplant or dying right from the time of listing, which is kind of getting at what you're asking. And it was interesting, the acetaminophen patients played out in about 48 hours. Either they got transplanted or they died or they're gonna recover. The other ones though took up to five days. So you're still transplanting your fulminant Bs, your autoimmunes, four, five, six days later. So I think that's very relevant and we proved it, but I, I think that's kind of intuitive that what I would expect that the regeneration is more rapid if it's gonna happen with acetaminophen. And so that brings up the other issue is, is there any other pro-regenerative medicine that we could give to avoid transplanting someone even if they're listed? And there's some very provocative data from um, India suggesting that GM CSF may enhance liver regeneration. I kind of find it hard to believe because <laughs> it's like 100% survival versus zero uh, in their pilot. Uh, so I, I, I'm a little skeptical 
We've talked about maybe doing a clinical trial there, but uh, you know, maybe. And certainly not the standard of care. Any other questions for Dr. Kosmina? Great. Well, it looks like we're safe here. Thank you.